morning, everyone. Good morning, and welcome to Sabbath School. Welcome to the first Tulsa Seventh-day Adventist Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I still have a ma my mask on. You know, there's a new ordinance, and <laughs> I didn't quite take it off yet. But anyway, welcome. We're glad that you're here. We want to thank you for uh, joining us in person and also for those who are live streaming. We're so thankful that we have this wonderful privilege. Let's bow our heads right now and ask God uh, to be with us formally. Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus we come. We're so thankful for the gift of life and for the wonderful privilege of prayer. Be with us as we study the word of God. Be with your people the world over. We thank you for keeping us through the storms of life and be with us as we sing praises and uh, review the word of God in your presence today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Our theme song will be uh, up on the screen here, and it's Christ the Lord has risen today. That's the right wrong tune. Christ for the world. I have the wrong tune, don't I? You see what we do? I want to remind you, folks, that we're not professionals, but we're so thankful to be children of God, and we're doing the best we can to. Uh, get to you the word of God and uh, um, I'm uh, glad that you joined us for Sabbath School. Now we have to get our song on the screen so that you can sing along with us. We love it uh, when um, you sing along with us. Yes. All right. Christ the world. Now it's up on there. Hymn number 370. Uh, we see the wonderful words. Christ the world we sing. The word to Christ we bring with loving zeal. All right. So we're about ready to sing. Christ for the world we sing, the world to Christ we bring, with loving zeal, the poor and the them that mourn, the faint and the overborn, sin, sin and the sorrow one, whom Christ doth heal. Christ for the world we sing, the world to Christ we bring, with fervent prayer, the wayward and the lost, by restless passions tossed, redeemed at countless cost. From dark despair, cries for the world we sing, the world to cross we bring with joyful song, the newborn souls whose days reclaim from the heroes' ways. Inspired with hope and praise to Christ belong. I always want to sing another verse. <clears throat> thank you, James, and thank you all for uh, being here and singing with us. Uh, the, uh, there was a silent killer in your Yena's home. Uh, See if we can. Uh, there was a silent killer in your Yena's home. We don't want that just quite yet, Gary. There we go. Uh, our offering for this quarter is the West Central Africa Division. And you see the list of uh, countries here on the screen. And uh, here is the. Uh, uh, list of projects for the quarter and uh, today we have a, uh, a very interesting video about plant-based diet. There was a silent killer in your Yina's home. Our family was eventually dying because of our kitchen. Because what was produced from the kitchen was not healthy to the body. It was slowly sapping the life and health of his family. Your Yina and his wife got sick. Your Yina was feeling worse every day. 
He felt so sick that he thought about committing suicide. That was until he discovered the silent killer that was slowly taking away their health. The type of food we were using was already damaged food, overcooked and all that. When I came across one Seventh-day Adventist evangelist and I read through his, some of his literatures, I discovered that I was living a very wrong life. A ray of hope came when Yorina learned of a health seminar organized by the nearby Adventist church. He asked his wife to go since he was feeling very sick. After the meeting, Yorina's wife came home equipped with newfound knowledge. As she made me feeling bad, she started applying water therapy on me straight. What she learned there, she never knew, had idea about that ever. She applied the water therapy, cold and hot water on me, covering me, and before you know I was sweating, we started having a new lifestyle. The lessons from the health seminar had a tremendous impact on Yorina and his wife. Their yard, which was once full of chickens, is now empty. In its place, Yorina planted different types of medicinal and health-giving plants like moringa and aloe vera. The plants are all around their house. They also take advantage of fresh fruits and vegetables, which are abundant in Nigeria. Yorina is now living a healthy and happy life. He and his wife are ambassadors of the health message, teaching what they learn to anyone they can. They started building a small space in front of their house where they can teach people about health and the Bible. They've also used this space to start a small Bible study group. But Yorina is just one man, and the city of Abuja has more than three million people, people who would benefit a lot from hearing the health message. This quarter, your 13th Sabbath offering will help build a medical center there. This center will help treat illnesses and show people a better way to live. I look forward to a medical center that people we say that there's a health facility. When you go there, all you see is love within the health workers there. There's a health facility that when you go there, there's something else you, you receive apart from the routine things, routine services you see in other health facilities. Please pray for the development of this health center and for the other projects this quarter. Thank you for supporting the 13th Sabbath offering. So this was actually the one that we showed last week in case some of you thought it looked familiar. So now we'll have the uh, correct one about butterflies. Tim made some bold and radical decisions in his life. He quit his job moved to a foreign country with his family and invested their money in starting a ministry. Leaving their lives in Australia behind, Tim and his family purchased a piece of land in Siem Reap, Cambodia, wanting to establish a place of hope and healing for the community. They started a school to help kids from poor families. They also organized programs to help families earn an income. Aside from helping families, Tim built small houses within their property to serve as a shelter for young men and women who don't have a place to stay, or those without family. Prayer has been a vital part of Tim's daily activities. After living in Cambodia for many years, he prayed for a new, unique way to introduce people to God. After months of earnest prayers, God answered Tim's petitions and helped him establish a butterfly farm that was available to the community and tourists as well. Butterfly Paradise is about helping visitors, local and international, experience the beauty and design in nature and therefore come to see the need for a designer. And we want to, them to see that that designer is God, the God of Genesis chapter 1, who created all things in six days. The beauty of nature is a unique way to attract visitors and introduce the topic of creation. The butterfly paradise allows people to gain a deeper understanding of God's wonderful creation. And so when they come here, then we will be seeking to draw them to God. We have a cinema here, and as they come into the air-conditioned cinema and get out of the heat, then they will be introduced to the theme of design in nature and God as designer. We have a vegetarian restaurant 
and we had to use the vegetarian restaurant there as a way of helping people see that their designer had a particular diet in mind so they could maintain good health. Then we have an educational area where people can learn about the life cycle of the butterfly. They realize the complexity of the life of the butterfly and that again, there's a designer involved. The final stop is at the souvenir shop. Here, guests can bring home memories of their unique experience in nature. The funds from the shop help to run the operations, but not everything has a price tag. There is free literature to take too. The Butterfly Paradise is not only reaching out to the public, but it also reaches in to every staff member. They may find a deeper understanding of the Bible and a purpose to serve other people. Butterfly Paradise is staffed with young people that have come through our orphanage and come through our school. And so these young people, they've learned about Jesus in the orphanage, in the school. And so we're giving them an environment where they can continue to grow in Christ, where they can have Sabbath off and where they actually get to share their love for God with other people. And so as they go through this experience, their own salvation is strengthened and renewed daily. Saraya came from a poor family. Tim enrolled her in their school. At this institution, she learned about the Bible and was drawn closer to Christ. Then she accepted Christ into her heart and was baptized. I have learned uh, so many things from this place. I have education, how to cook, yeah, how to mango with, God, uh, with people, and how to um, do evangelism, give the Bible study. And now I have a job, and I have a family, and thank God for this place. Please pray for Tim and the Butterfly Paradise. This supporting ministry is a positive influence in the city of Siem Reap. Please pray that more young people will get the chance to have a good education and a deeper understanding of their purpose. So a very uh, a unique way to witness to uh, actually have a butterfly farm as an attraction to uh, use in telling about creation. So just an example that literally just about anything you can think of is a way to witness. And uh, I think probably uh, if you run a store or you have a service station or whatever uh, business you're involved with, uh, the same uh, kinds of possibilities are there. So uh, uh, just remember our uh, Sabbath school offerings when you make out your offerings online or put them in a tithe envelope and then put it in the collection box by, by both doors in the back. We have two new collection boxes back there uh, and it says offerings on them. So, um, uh, please make use of them, and we appreciate uh, the faithfulness of God's people in this church. Uh, since the coronavirus has been in effect and our attendance has been down, guess what's happened to our offerings? They've increased. So uh, praise the Lord uh, for his spirit and for uh, everyone's faithfulness in giving. Well, our uh, lesson for this quarter is Making Friends for God by Mark Findlay. And Seeing People Through Jesus' Eyes is our lesson topic for today. Tom Huff is going to be leading the lesson. We have uh, David Miller and Jackie Wilson and uh, Josh, Wilson, uh, Josh Roberts. Roberts' dog got out this morning, so I'm not sure if he's going to make it for Sabbath school or not, but if he does, he'll be here. Good morning. Before we begin, let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for giving us this lesson to study, to learn from, to show us the importance and how to witness and what we should, how we should feel about the people we are to bring your message to. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, today's lesson is very important, seeing people through Jesus' eyes. Sometime 
we have this tendency to not do that. Is there someone that you might look down on? Someone you're uncomfortable with? Someone who doesn't look just like you or maybe even smell just like you? Some people who make you uncomfortable to be around? Well, as we study this lesson, I want you to think about that. As we see what Jesus said about that. How did Jesus see people? We will get to this introduction here in a minute. First, I want to read the memory verse. Then he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And then the lesson goes on to talk about the fishermen and his work with them. You know, if you've ever been around a bunch of men fishing, man, that, that's not a good environment for very many people, even the fishermen themselves. Men left on their own sometimes can go downhill a little. We need, you know, it said men, man needs a woman, and he was right. But at the same time, Jesus saw through all of that. He saw men as a as a tool that they could use he could use to reach the world and i say men he he definitely means women too it was a different time nowadays i'm sure there would have been some some women in that group too but at the same time it was the way they lived just going from town to town place to place it was probably best that it was all a bunch of men but let me read this first paragraph in the introduction not the first one second one jesus saw all men and women as winnable for his kingdom he saw each one through the eyes of divine compassion he saw peter not as a rough loudmouth fisherman but as a mighty preacher of the gospel he saw james and john not as quick-tempered fiery radicals but as enthusiastic proclaimers of his grace he saw the deep yearning for genuine love and acceptance in the hearts of Mary Magdalene and the Samaritan woman and the woman with the issue of blood. He saw Thomas not as a cynical doubter, but as one with sincere questions. Whether they were Jew or Gentile, male or female, a thief on the cross or a centurion or a demon-possessed madman, Jesus saw their God-given potential and both viewed them through salvation's eyes. So how did God see everyone? He saw everybody was somebody that was he, it's one of them he died to save, and he knew if you'd uh, maybe be sensitive to his spirit that he'd even teach us, how could you find the key to that person's heart? How could you know what to say? He certainly had a, a, a very diverse way of approaching people. He didn't approach them all the same. Did he see anyone as a lost cause? Apparently not. He saw everyone as winnable. Everyone is winnable. Do we look at people like that? Have you ever been part of a, a crusade, a big evangelistic crusade? You know, and it might not be the best way to do it, but they look at people who, this is a good, this is a good prospect, somebody we really need to work on. And they, they kind of, I won't say they number them, but in their visits and everything, there's some who they say, you know, I just don't see this happening. We, we'll visit them, we'll work with them, but I don't see this happening. I have a quote here, and it says, Christianity is not a debt payment system. And like you said, none of us are winnable. So we can't look at the other person as less than. We are all in the same boat in need of a Savior. When we look at somebody as not being winnable, we're kind of judge, being a little bit judgmental, aren't we? Uh, sometimes we need to look in the mirror about winnable and not winnable. I remember we had a, a friend in our church down in Alabama who uh, later became a Bible worker. But I think in his early days, as I recall, he, he, would, he would go to visit this uh, Seventh-day Adventist church up in the semi-Chicago area that uh, some Korean people that just really welcomed him in and even though he sounded like we'd come in there inebriated and so forth their uh, kindness to him kind of broke through that barrier 
and uh, won his heart. If we look at the screen, we see how did, did Jesus see people. And he saw people with sympathy. You know, that comes through very strong as you read Jesus' life. He considered each person a life to save. We understand that very well. But this third one, he saw what they would become if they accepted salvation. Now, that is a little bit harder. Have you seen people, if you've been in the church while well, you've seen a lot of people come into the church? And some people, we don't know what is going to happen when they come into the church, do we? I mean, we don't know whether they're going to become strong leaders, whether they're going to be more interested in an outreach as opposed to an inreach ministry. We don't know, but Jesus could see what they would become if they accepted salvation. It says each person was valuable and unique for Jesus. I think that's where each of us need to go back to the beginning of our faith walk. Because if we truly understood the purpose of the cross, then we would probably have more compassion for each other. Right. He, he didn't die for, for, he died for everyone, didn't he? Mm -hmm. He didn't die for a specific group of people. You know, you'd think that sometimes the, um, one of the, you might say, rewards that a, a teacher gets when they have a group of people who come into their classroom that don't have a clue, you know, about this or that. And the uh, teacher is able to somehow see in these people sometimes, a good teacher, what they might become if uh, they're educated properly and uh, could take some information and, uh, and, like they say, kind of blossom like a rose, you know. You know, that's talking of teachers and seeing the potential in their students, I have yet to understand how you can take a child who doesn't read or write, know their letters, and by the end of the school you're having them reading. But they do. You know, it, it, it takes a real talent, a real patience. It, the same things that we need to show new people when we meet them. Mm -hmm. You've got to go the extra mile. Yes, it does. Let's move on to Sunday's lesson, the second touch. You know, I found that very interesting, some of the things it had in here. It talks about Jesus working in two stages. Can you think of it? it talk, there's no other miracle that we know of where it didn't completely work the first time, that he had to go back and take a second touch at it mm -hmm. I find that interesting and this is a, 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 until I read this lesson I never thought about this being a unique miracle that it was a two part miracle um, before we get to what's your impression why why he did it in a two step because we know he did it for a reason because he absolutely could have healed him fully well on the first try if he had wanted to what was he teaching us? You know, I, I've thought of that um, before. And, uh, you know, I was just thinking this morning, you know, there's one of the, the last miracles he performed was where he, he raised Lazarus from the dead. And, you know, um, one of the things that uh, the story tells there, of course, portrays Jesus delaying a few days uh, before he went to his special friend's place to keep him alive. And so you could see how disappointed the sisters were when they said to him, if you'd only come, he wouldn't have died. And I guess that's probably true that, you know, Christ, the, 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 who's all life in his presence, Lazarus probably wouldn't have died. But in the process, these sisters, Jesus was trying to help build their faith. I think he says, only believe, you know. He's going to rise. And that's, well, I know he will at the end, you know, but you could see even their faith wasn't quite there. And I've sometimes thought with well, this fella, maybe in addition to uh, some of the other reasons that uh, our, our lesson author brings out uh, about why 
he did it in two stages. Uh, I've sometimes thought, well, this man himself, you know, inspiration talks to us about, uh, you know, in the arms of our faith, we may come to a person and they don't have faith to believe they could be healed. But if, if we have faith to believe they could be healed and we lift them up in the arms of our faith and we lift them to the Lord, Lord, you know, we know you have power to heal this person. And, um, and, and so it builds in them faith. And so this man himself may have had his faith grow with stage one. Hey, I can see, I can see a tree, a man like trees walking. You know, like I, we made some great progress. And maybe his faith rose to the occasion, you know, and Christ could say, well, let's give you the full package. I think if you look at this story, even before God healed the man, Jesus healed the man, the Lord removed them out of where he was. And many times in our faith walk, we have to remove the distractions in our lives. The same thing. And it's a process just like a baby. Most babies, they crawl, then they walk. None of us have reached. And it's in the same thing with this man. The Lord healed him in two stages. So Jesus is not the problem. We are. You know, in the, if we read the text on this, it talks about they brought him to Jesus and they begged Jesus to heal him so I think about sometimes as the two part our part is bringing them to mm -hmm. Jesus absolutely then that second part is what Christ does mm -hmm. we can't do it all on our own can we absolutely. we might open their eyes and they see some vague ideas but until they let Christ work in their lives, the miracle is not done mm -hmm. yet. Mm -hmm. And it talks about in the, in the lesson, it mentions of the 25 or so miracles, specific miracles, over half of them were people who were brought to Jesus by their friends or their families. So this is that two stage mm -hmm. that we're seeing is our part and God's part. You know, I find it interesting. We wonder if this man had ever seen before. Was he born blind? I don't think so, because he talks about seeing them as trees. Yeah, <laughs> he knew what trees were. Well, what's a tree? You know, you can feel it or, you know, so I look at that as, as more of a um, he was getting his vision back. I remember one time having a patient, and um, she was born blind. And I remember she had her, her CNI dog and everything there. And I went into the patient room where she was, and uh, the lights were turned off. And she just commented to me. She said, well, I, I was just reading over here. And, of course, she read Braille and was reading in the dark, you know. And that was my a different style of reading than I was used to. Uh, but but anyway, she she uh, I asked her. I says, well, what is it like uh, when you hear people talk about red and blue and green and you know various things we're familiar with? What do you, what comes to your mind if you've never seen those colors? And she basically says, well, you know, I don't know what to think because she had never seen. What a gift. I think, too, you know, that gift that Jesus describes giving us there in Revelation uh, chapter 3, our last day church that is blind, but he has a remedy for us, and that remedy is a special ISAV. And I think inspiration kind of makes that pretty clear, that ISAV is to be able to see spiritually, to see what's right, see what's wrong, discern between good and bad. You know, this... As in many places in the Bible, you can draw more than one lesson Absolutely. from a story. In this one paragraph toward the bottom of the page, it says, Is it possible that we too do not see people clearly? Do we sometimes see them more like trees walking in vague, shadowy forms rather than as candidates for the kingdom? What do you think leads us at times to not see people clearly? Mm. Can I just read this um, scripture? Romans 12, verse 16 from the New Living Translation. It says, live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And don't think you know it all. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. 
Well, that's, that's, those are good words, aren't they? Live in peace with everyone. Don't be a know-it-all. I mean, these are, those are words to live by. Um, you think as Adventists, sometimes we get the feeling that we do know it all? Yes. And when you approach someone with that attitude, you don't get very far. You're wrong, I'm right. You know, all you're looking for is a fight then, an argument or a fight. In, later on in the lesson, we'll talk about how to approach people who are hard and difficult to deal with. But you know, um, sorry, earlier this month, there was in the devotional, there was a story uh, where the young lady was going through some problems, whatever it was, and somebody told her, go to church. And she said, why should I go? I already feel bad about myself. So we need to check ourselves. She said, I already feel bad about myself. Yeah, so why should she go to church? Yeah, she, she got a guilt trip when she went to church, didn't mm -hmm. it seems like. Do you think that is what... We never saw Christ try to put guilt trips on people, did we? Even as we're getting ready to talk about the lady at the well, the Samaritan woman, even though he was able to know her past, he didn't put a guilt trip on her. She left happy telling people that she thought she had met possibly Christ. So let's keep, let's go on to Monday. A lesson in acceptance. I found this very interesting. Let's look at what it says on the screen. So Jesus sees beyond race, culture, sex, and religion. Let's start right there. That is so interesting that he does that. You know, in our church, as we look around in the First Tulsa Church, we seem to be accepting of a lot of uh, race, sex, there's Different, different races, different sexes on the on the platform today in our congregation. I love that the diversity that we have here, but there's other people who could show up who we might not feel that way about. What if three motorcycles drove up bikers and they got out and came in with their tattoos all over them and everything? How would in the and the trappings that go along with being a biker. You think we might feel uncomfortable? You think we might not approach them the same way we would others? There's, and religion. Hopefully our church was, is changing. When I was a young child as an Adventist, there was a certain other religion who we were, you know, we were almost taught to be fearful of. Stay away from those people. And, uh, you know, I, I was raised my whole life till I was grown and made friends of my own to realize they were people just like me. They were seeking the Lord just like me in different ways. And it says in the second part, when we see others with God's sympathy, every barrier is brought down. How does, how did we do that, bring these barriers down? You know, we were raised with these ideas. How do we bring those barriers down? You know, I think, I think God can give us even words to speak and the very expressions on our face and everything else sends a message to people, our body language. And, you know, and uh, the same is true in a medical practice. You know, people, um, I remember someone, even when I was in medical school, telling us, he says, now, when some patient comes in there and they tell you about all their bad habits, you know, don't uh, act like, ah, you're shocked about this. <laughs> You've got to be able to basically accept these people wherever they are. And I think that's a good, good lesson that could be translated into spiritual terms as well. I think it starts with just the little graces. Good morning. Um, a good person for that who speaks to everybody is Elder James. 
It doesn't matter who it is. He just goes up to you and say hi. And it takes just little graces. I don't need to know where you're from, why you're here. Just the little things of good morning, hello, how are you? Little things like that can mm-hmm. open up a whole lot. Amen. And going back to beyond race and culture, if you remember in the Bible the story with the disciples when they went out to fish, didn't catch anything. And the Lord tell them, go on the other side, put out the net. If you notice, he did not say use a pole. <laughs> and it's the same thing with our Christian walk. Many times we fish with a pole. When you fish with a pole, you only catch what you want. When you use a net, you don't know what you're going to take in. And that's what God wants us to do, fish with a net. That's good. I thought you were going to say fishing with a pole. You might poke somebody or hit them. I wasn't sure where you were going with that. But the net is a much better way to do it. Okay, let's finish this. It says... There's no more separation because they are future citizens of heaven. We may not share or accept their political or religious ideas, but we love them and we want the best for them. Sometimes people with different ideas than us, it's hard for us to love them and want the best for them. A good way to do that is pray for them. If you feel like they're going down the wrong road, instead of saying, hey, you need to stop that, you need to turn around, you need to quit eating this, you need to pray for them. Let God work in their lives. Give him that opportunity. Uh, and the love that you show is your best best thing you can do. You know, I think unless Christianity, unless Christ has changed our hearts, our natural human spirit is to look down on somebody else. You know, I mean, even in a classroom, um, kids can be some of the meanest ones sometimes to their fellow classmates. You know, the one that's the shortest or the one that's the tallest or the one that's the skinniest or the one that's the fattest or the one that's this or that, that we can really make them an issue, you know, to make uh, and the lack of acceptance. And I think, you know, growing up in Texas, Texans, you know, weren't real famous for being the most humble in terms of their attitude about their state and their this and their that. My brother told me he would even saw a T-shirt down there recently that said, I wasn't born in Texas, but I got here as quick as I could. And uh, I think the thought of how we viewed other states and people from those areas. And, you know, even when I went to Ohio and Culporter one summer, and I noticed the people from Ohio looked down upon the people from West Virginia. And then you, you realize, well, you know, the people who were in Judea looked down upon the Samaritans like this little woman was where Jesus met her out at the well, you know. And uh, I think he gave a, quite a class one time when he hiked all the way down to that Syrophoenician woman that had a young woman, her daughter, that was affect, uh, afflicted with the devil, and she just somehow had heard of Jesus. Jesus must have come all the way out there with his disciples to teach them this class of how they treated her as a dog because she was from another socioeconomic, another, you know, she wasn't a Jew. She wasn't one of those believers in the true God. And, and of course, she was a real persistent soul and kept saying, but, Lord, even the dogs get the crumbs. Throw me one, you know. And, of course, then he turned the tables, made it real clear for the disciples how they ought to treat somebody. I believe what you said, sorry, what you said about prayer. Pray for them, but also let them know you're praying for them. We are living in such a time that people are fearful even in the church and we have to let our brothers and sisters know hey i got your back i'm here for you and we have to let people know you let people know but we have to do it in a way that doesn't say you're wrong you're in bad shape i'm going to pray for you anyway no. we pray you know well, i'll i'll be praying about this some other way without what did they say heap, heaping hot coals upon them mm-hmm. you you can do that somebody you have a heated discussion with, but you break it off and say, well, I'll pray for you. You know, That makes it worse. That that's, makes it worse, doesn't that's it? That's where the spirit comes in. Yeah. That's where the spirit, you don't just go tell people that. Sometimes the spirit said, be quiet. Right. Many times we don't listen. Yeah. But that's where we have to listen to the spirit's leading. And he'll let you know when to go and when not to go. If a person is longing for help, wanting help, wanting to find something out, then letting them know that you're praying for them, I'm sure they would appreciate it 
very much. So everything we do like this, we have to do it out of kindness and love. Let's, oh, you know, as we continue on this lesson, this day's lesson, it's, let's look at John 4, 3 through 34, because there's some very specific questions. It says, how did Jesus approach the Samaritan woman? And now on the slide, it says Mark 8, 22, 26, and I don't know where it got that but it says that on the next bunch of them and it's not right. Let's go start right there on three. It says, how did Jesus approach the Samaritan woman? What's the first thing he said to her? Let's look at that. We don't, want to, we don't need to read this whole thing. Ask for a drink. Give me a drink. His disciples had left. He was there by himself. Give me a drink. Now, and then what was her response? How is it you being a Jew ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Okay, so this was people who, a people, I almost get the impression that we talk about the Jews having some contempt for the Samaritans. I think it might have worked both ways. If someone has contempt for me, Chances are I'm going to feel that same way toward them. You know, it, it doesn't make sense any other way. So she's saying, why are you asking me for a drink? And what did Jesus say? If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water living water that that's such a a wonderful word living water uh, but we think about all different kinds of water we think you know there's salt water there's dirty water the brackish water there's clean water that we we really like you know sometimes we drink have you ever drank water distilled water mm. not very good is it mm. not very good but you get some good, clean, clear water. Tulsa's water used to be extremely nice, but it's very good, but it doesn't even compare to the living water that Christ could give us. He said that if you get this water, you'll never thirst again. Do you think she understood all of this when he first said it? No, I don't think so. You can tell as this discussion goes along, she's... She's thinking to herself, what, what's he talking about? Let's go on to the next slide. In verse what is that, 14, it says, Jesus answered and said, that Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. Whoever drinks of the water that I shall give will never thirst. And the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Okay, a fountain, this has two meanings. If you have been into a, seen a fountain, the water goes somewhere, doesn't it? The water doesn't just keep filling up right there, it goes somewhere. If it's a natural fountain, there's a creek or river running down to it. If it's a man-made fountain, there's an outlet for the water to go down. In other words, that water that you give, you don't, you don't keep it. It keeps going. It, you spread it out. It goes out. It's a fountain, sprays the water all over. That's how you do with that living water. You spread it all over. And likewise with the water, I think, as you read the story, the Lord had planned to go this direction. Not only that, he could have gotten the water himself. Yeah. You know, so we need to address people, not overlook people, but also as Christians, as followers of Christ, we need to be intentional as Christians. Right. You know, every day we should ask God for an appointment. It's out there. We may not see it the way we want to, but you always give us an appointment, somebody to reach out there. And it doesn't have to be a scripture, but just kindness 
again, it goes back to people are going through stuff. Mm -hmm. So whatever it is, just kindness, be intentional about your Christian walk. Amen. As we continue reading this, let's go, let's go back to the lesson. I want to read what Ellen White in the Signs of the Time wrote. The eternal lesson that Jesus longed to teach his disciples in each one of us is simple. Simply this, those who have the Spirit of God, Spirit of Christ, will see all men through the eyes of divine compassion. Okay, we will all see through divine compassion. Those, that is something to strive for our entire life because it's easy to slide back and go back to our old thought patterns and not look at people that, that way. Let's go to Tuesday, and this is a real important one. Sometimes we feel like we have to go places before we can start ministering, don't we? We can't minister right where we're at, but this lesson says, begin where you are. Now, Tulsa, it depends on what, what do you want to call Tulsa. Do we have 400,000? Do we have a little air, larger area, 500,000, the county? Anyway, we have a lot of people here. So it's very easy for us to begin where we are. There's nothing wrong with being a missionary. That's a great calling if it's for you. But if you don't want to go to a far off country, you can be a missionary right here in Tulsa. We have outreach opportunities coming up every day. Right here, it says, someone rightly said in life, the only place to start from is where you are, for there is no other place to begin. Jesus emphasized this in principle in Acts 1, in which he declared, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. He started out, what did he say? Start where you are, right in, here in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, right here. And he probably had, it, it was probably more difficult in some instances and easier in other instances to start right where he was at. It seemed like the most important part of that sentence you just read, though, is that first couple lines where it says, it's like you wait here until that Holy Spirit power comes upon you. You right. don't need to go anywhere until he comes. <laughs> And so, in other words, our ability to do anything, whether it's here or overseas, you know, I, I remember when I went as a student missionary to Japan for a year, and I, it finally dawned on me, even while I was out there, you know, if I wasn't a missionary at home, what would make you think that you'd be a missionary once you got over across the ocean? And I think that that's uh, certainly a great principle in the home, in the community, in the church. If uh, we're not a missionary where we are, we're not a missionary anywhere. That's, that's, that's for sure. You know, in our own lives, when it says start where you are, who's closest to you? Well, your family. Your family. Is that not the hardest place to be a missionary? Your own family? Your own family knows your faults. They know your weaknesses. They know the areas where you slip that you need to improve on. And so sometimes it's harder to reach them. How, how do you reach your family? How do you go about getting them to do it? I know the lesson, well, let's talk about Andrew first. Andrew, in John 140, if we could have that, yes. Why don't you like to read that for me? One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. Okay, so the first person he went to was his brother. Now, this is interesting. It, it doesn't help as much as we might think because he didn't claim to be a Christian at that time either. You know, it was, if so, his brother Simon couldn't say, well, look at, you know, you're not 
living up to what you know or anything like that. So that, but it did talk about going to your family first. So I, I find that very, very interesting. Later on this day, we'll talk more about the, the family. I believe that some of us, let me be politically correct, I believe some of us are living double lives. Hmm. We're loving, compassionate, giving in the church among God's people. But when we, be, when we get behind the closed doors where the husband, the wife, the children are, we're living a completely different life. And that's where we have to ask God to show us to live as he would have us to live because eventually the real you is going to come out. You know, and going back to your family, um, especially if they grew up together in the faith and they've left, it can be very difficult. My brother is a good example. You know, he stopped going to church, whatever. But I still encourage him. I still talk with him. We still share whatever it is because he's still my brother. And that's how we also, as we treat our family as such, because we have to remember the home is an extension of the church. And you start at home, and then you branch out into the world. That's true. As we look farther down the lesson, it says, the art of effective soul winning is the art of building positive, caring relationships. Think about the people close to you who may not know Jesus? Do they sense in your life someone who is compassionate and caring? That that sometimes hits heart hits home to some of us. Someone compa compassionate and caring. Now you see, I wear this shirt. The Adventist North American Division made a com a really big issue about compassion and. Our last pastor got this shirt, and he got me one. Now, he said he was just thought of, about me when he got it, but at the same time, I wonder, do I need to look at this and read compassion a little more often on this shirt? And, and I think that goes for a lot of people here, the idea of showing compassion all the time. I don't mean when a little child gets hurt and you rush and care for them. How about when his 15-year-old brother gets hurt and who's a little bit obnoxious and you're, <laughs> you know, kind of difficult to be around? You still need to show that same compassion or some homeless person on the street. I don't say you bring them all home with you and everything and do that. But there's a difference in how you feel inside, whether you have that compassion or whether you have disgust at their lives. And do we ever in the Bible, does it mention anything about Jesus having disgust for people? Even when he ran the people out of the temple, the money changers and those people, he wasn't discussed with them it was their actions and what they were doing and how they were treating his God his father so how should we treat our family I look at that and it witness the family with kindness and compassion and the number one thing watch for that opportunity watch for that chance you know sometimes we don't hear it talked about so much with religion, but we talk about a lot of people can tell you when they had an opportunity with money, boy, if I had just invested when I, I should have, I would have made so much money. If I had just bought that, that old car when I saw it, I could have turned around and sold it for 10 times what, it, what I gave for it. But they let opportunity slip by. We have to watch for that opportunity. In fact, as we look at the... Um, um, Elder, yes. I just want to say, as you say about compassion, I know we must treat our family with compassion, but I would encourage, especially those who have children in the home, the children are watching the mothers and the fathers, how they relate to each other. And I was taught this from young. 
if you want to know what's going on in somebody's house, watch the children. So we got to be careful. Oh, I think you're absolutely right. And what you said earlier about what goes on in the house and the, in the home is so important mm -hmm. and makes it difficult later on when our, our children do stray away to get them back until they see a change in your life. It's, it's very difficult. Let's move on. We're running short on time as normal. Um, dealing with difficult people. Boy, that's tough, isn't it? You know, I can, I'm usually pretty nice with people at work. I'm, I'm a manager of a condominiums, and I have to deal with all kinds of people. I have to deal with the people who live there. I have to deal with the people who are coming to work there, whether somebody hires a carpenter or a plumber, or, or I have hired them, or, or people outside working, yard people. I have to deal with a lot of people, and I really usually start out nice, very nice. But if if they come at, back at me with something other than being nice themselves, I have this tendency to turn on a dime, you know, and I, I have to show more compassion, more lovingness, more kindness, and accepting. But it's very easy when someone gets a little bit harsh with you, I don't, you know, I want to stop it right then. You know, I will jump all over that. And I need to jump all over it with Christ instead of jumping all over it in my own harshness. And I think this dealing with difficult people, we never saw Jesus respond to people with harshness. And we saw the way he was treated throughout the Bible with people, by people. I but, think, go ahead. if we're honest, each of us all need a makeover concerning yeah. dealing with difficult people. And I think many times people look at Christians as soft, so they could say whatever it is they want to say to you, and sometimes you have to respond, and sometimes you have to walk away. Because you're being compassionate and a Christian doesn't mean let people talk to you crazy, if right. you want to put it like that. But sometimes you have to walk away and let the Holy Spirit lead. And for me, one of the scriptures I use every night before I go to work is Psalms 141, verse 3. And I use it for church, too. Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door off my lips. Because the Lord is not through with me yet. So, so at times I do respond, and the Lord has to check me. So each of us have to realize we need a makeover, but there's still hope. Amen. Amen. You know, on my mirror at home, I have James 1 on it because of the things that he says, a number of things he says real close together about being be a be a hearer or doer, not just a hearer. Yeah, there we go. I read it, but I don't have it memorized quite well enough right now. But anyway, it's so important for us. In the lesson, it talks about Jesus certainly believed that none have fallen so low. None are so vile, but that they can find deliverance in Christ. Amen. So, we don't treat that people that way sometimes, do we? Absolutely not. Uh, it says Jesus was a master dealing with difficult people by both his words and his actions. You know, Sometimes you can say words, but your actions say something else, don't they? They, they say, I really don't care. You know, I, I will talk nice to you and I will say what you want to hear, but I, I really couldn't care less. And that, that's why it says our, our actions also, not just what we say, but our actions. Um, in Hebrews 12, verse 14, again, the New Living Translation says, Work at living in peace with everyone and work at living a holy life. For those who are not holy will not see the Lord. Look after each other so that none of you fail to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. Yeah. You know, 
We just have a couple minutes. There's more we can talk about here. I really want to get into Thursday just for a second. It says, Sense, sensing providential opportunities. What in our church we call providential opportunities a little different? We have a different word for it. Divine appointments. I've heard that word used, used quite a bit. But it says, the book of Acts is filled with stories of how the disciples took advantage of providential opportunities for the advancement of God's kingdom. And it talks about Paul. He was waiting for Titus. Got there, he wasn't there, but he saw the opportunity to go on to Macedonia. So he took it. The door opened. Paul stepped right through it. He didn't wait around. He said, this has to be God's leading. I am moving forward. As Christians, we have to do that. When the opportunity comes, it would be, it's too easy to say, well, let me think about that. Just like if, I, if I'm trying to buy something and somebody tells me it's a one-time deal, you do it right now or it's not going to happen, someone else wants it or I can't offer this deal tomorrow, usually I look at that as a, a thing I should avoid. If someone's trying to pressure me into doing that. I think Dr. Miller would know about this as a doctor being on call. And as Christians, we should always be on call likewise. Right. And it talks about Philip when he was told to take the road to speak to the Ethiopian eunuch. He did, didn't he? He Absolutely. didn't hesitate. He ran. Yeah, he ran. He caught a chariot. Now, I don't know. If you've been around horses, I don't know if the horse was walking. It says the man was sitting in his chariot, which I, I didn't know you ever sat in a chariot. I thought you had to stand up to ride a chariot. I, that shows what I know. But anyway, he was maybe the chariot was sitting still. The horse was resting. I don't know. Anyway, he was sitting in his chariot when, uh, when he was caught there. So, I find that interesting. All these opportunities that came and these disciples. And missionaries stepped right through the door. What's amazing is that God, with his infinite power, can help us do the same thing. You know, if he could latch on to Philip and just transport him supernaturally right over where this guy needed to be, and then afterwards take him over to Azotus and say, now you step up in the chariot and I'll tell you what to say. He could really help us too. And I thought this was really a good passage here where it mentions, it said... Uh, an angel guided Philip to the one who was seeking for light and who was ready to receive the gospel. And today, angels will guide the footsteps of those workers who will allow the Holy Spirit to, one, sanctify their tongues, two, refine and ennoble their hearts. I was thinking that's kind of the preparation we need to be able to do what you're talking about. And we talk about how do we know if it's an opportunity we need to step through? Well... That comes from God. That comes from the Holy Spirit. How do we get the Holy Spirit? Prayer, studying God's Word. There's only two ways to get the Holy Spirit. And it takes both, actually. Mm -hmm. So I just encourage you. This is a great quarter we're dealing with. We're studying how to be soul winners for Christ. The most important thing that we can study, I think. So... Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for being with us today, helping us as we study that word. Please be with us in the future in this quarter. Help us to study these lessons to gain a blessing from them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we'll be leaving you for a few minutes, but we'll be back in about 15 minutes and start church. Today we have camp meeting. See you later.